Okay, well, we will get started. So welcome again, everyone. Um, my name is Matthew Engelke. I'm the director of the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life here at Columbia University. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the last event in our magic series for this calendar, for, for this academic year. We will have some more events in the fall, we hope, but um, we're very pleased to welcome um, Professor Alexis Wells Ogogome um, from uh, Stanford University. She is a assistant professor in the um, Department of Religious Studies there. Um, and she's gonna be speaking to us about some of her um, brand new research. Um, she is uh, trained in um, religious studies and in history uh, at Emory University. She received her PhD from Emory University. Uh, she works at the intersection of race, um, gender, and religion uh, with a particular focus on the American South. Um, she has a wonderful first book, which is still relatively new. I think, yeah, just last year. So I think that counts as brand new in the academic world um, called The Souls of Women Folk, The Religious Cultures of Enslaved Women in the American South that was published by the University of North Carolina Press at Chapel Hill. Um, uh, so tonight, Alexis is going to be speaking to us, as I mentioned, about um, her, her brand new research on um, a, a case involving an, an enslaved, a particular enslaved woman uh, in, I believe it's in Mississippi, but I think we'll be learning more. Uh, and it forms one element of a larger study that she's working on. Um, we have tonight a, a lecture format. So Alexis is gonna to speak to us for about uh, 40 minutes. We will then have time for some conversation. She and I will engage in some conversation and then we will open the floor to you all for questions. So please feel free at any time, um, really from the time that um, the lecture begins up through the Q&A to pose your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in, in the Zoom. Um, box. Uh, that's the best way to, um, to, to reach us, and I will read your questions aloud to, to Alexis. Um, before we get started, I just want to offer my thanks to the, the, the staff at IRCPL for their help in putting this together, especially Madeline de Jesus, who's here behind the scenes, and our colleague uh, Walid Hamam. Um, so yes, thank you so much, and I'm going to turn it now over to Alexis. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much to uh, Professor Engelke for the invitation. I am very excited um, to present this work today and looking forward to a conversation afterwards uh, because this is um, newish work for me. You know, as we were talking about this project, it's it's only been something I've turned to in the last three years which in his historian's time is yesterday, obviously. So um, still very new and still very exciting for me. Um, so I, I want to begin here um, with sort of uh, some thoughts about, um, about when I was completing my book. So I, as I approached the completion of my book, The Souls of Women Folk, uh, the editorial team, as many people know at, at any publisher or press, they're going to ask you to suggest some potential cover images. Um, and so they asked me to do this. And since the book was about the religious lives of enslaved women in Georgia and South Carolina, I knew that I really wanted a cover that attested to the complexity of bond women's inner lives, um, a cover that represented them not just as one dimensional figures, predominantly known as slaves in popular and academic historiography. Uh, but rather as humans who experienced childbirth, uh, childhood, raised their children, loved while enmeshed in one of the most brutal systems in human history. Yet as I went in search of these images, images appropriate to convey the idea of bond women's humanity, I was met with some very familiar and problematic tropes. Fueled by uh, anti-slave trade and ab abolitionist initiatives, the vast majority of the depictions of bond women presented the varied abuses perpetrated against them at the hands of human traffickers and slaveholders. A number of images spoke to voyeuristic sadism, 
uh, the, the same sort of sadism that threaded through, I would argue, much of the abolitionist literature. And it was designed to represent the violence of enslavement while appealing to these gender conventions around uh, women. So images like this one, uh, depicting a Captain Kimber who was accused of torturing a 14 year old girl to death for not dancing naked for him were as salacious as they were heinous. And sometimes the sadism was not overt, um, but rather hovered just beneath the surface as evidence in this depiction of women being branded on the coast of Western Africa, which in fact was not um, a really popular practice, but became a popular, very emblematic kind of symbol of slavery's brutality in the attempt to abolish the slave trade. Um, punitive scenes like this one also populated the archive, um, characterized by bond people in various states of undress while slaveholders and others beat them mercilessly, usually for uh, minor infractions. Um, and you have images that are depicting uh, these spectacular scenes of violence to more mundane scenes, I would argue. Um, scenes of public auctions that punctuate the contemporary articles about enslavement in the United States. And so this actual uh, image is one that, uh, though a historical image, you will find this image being used over and over again to talk about uh, the legacies of slavery in the United States. And so these are all scenes of violence, mutilation, humiliation, and trauma. And I would argue that these are the scenes that overwhelmingly shape not only how we see enslaved people, but in particular, how we see enslaved women. Um, or women gendered individuals, I should say. And, and I wanna make a note uh, that I do use the, the binary language here because slavery was a highly gendered enterprise and it was gendered in these very complex ways. If you're familiar with Hortense Spillers, you know she makes the argument about the non-gendered nature of it. I deviate from that slightly um, because the structures themselves were and, and the social uh, sociocultural configuration was really demarcated along gendered lines um, as dictated by slaveholders. Um, so I am gonna use this language, but I want there to be some, um, some acknowledgement that there is always gonna be fluidity in presentation, um, but not necessarily in how people are allowed to, to live. Um, and so I, these are the scenes that are going to heavily punctuate how we understand enslaved women. So after sifting through I would argue I went through maybe about, I don't know, it had to be like 300. I, I went through archives and every little uh, scrap I could find, I emailed everybody I knew. Um, I chose this for my book cover, uh, Tam, uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, Thomas Anschutz, It's the Way They Live, which was painted in West Virginia in 1879, over a decade after the end of slavery. So since the inception of the system that displaced and colonized humans in one locale for the production of goods in another, the term slave has been used to describe the people whose physical, intellectual, and reproductive resources supported a rapidly expanding global economy. Uh, through the discursive treatment of the persons bearing the designation, uh, though the discursive treatment of the persons bearing the designation has changed over time. And I'm just gonna start this up because I think this um, really illustrates um, the, this kind of, this narrative of dehuman, dehumanization. Um, and so this is a two minute breakdown of the slave trade. Anytime I give a talk, you also get a, a kind of crash course on <laughs> slavery. Um, but as you see these dots, these dots are representing where people are coming from and where they're going. And as you will see, as this timeline moves, the dots are not only gonna grow larger, but the rapidity with which you see them moving is going to grow as well. And so as you watch that, I would argue that uh, though the discursive treatment of persons bearing the designation has changed over time, the residue of its ontological significance persists. Enslaved persons often appear in scholarly and popular literature as undifferentiated, violated bodies who largely resided on the periphery of historical processes until their emancipation catapulted them into the role of historical actors. 
That is, as evidenced by the images of bond women, their statuses as enslaved people mark them as those who were acted upon, often violently and with impunity. This, I argue, is a part of the dangerous magic of the archive that shapes our understandings of enslaved women and the categories used to reconstruct their social, intellectual, and psychological worlds. Magic was rarely a term claimed by ritual practitioners of the early modern period. Rather, it was a term oftentimes externally imposed, a category applied to describe that which was non-normative, uh, other, or uh, for my purposes, not religion. Um, and in this case, I would argue, it, it, so when I say for my purposes, usually when I'm working with this category in my work, I'm thinking about it as it, it, in regards to the actual enactments of African descended peoples in the Americas. But I would argue when we're thinking about it as a category and the kinds of methodological and interpretive work it performs, I think it does the work of, of uh, the archive. We can think of the dangerous uh, magic of the archive uh, as a way of determining, determining what is not human. As we look at those images of, of bond women, there is, there is a mat, there is something happening there, especially in terms of the historiography and cultural memory around these individuals. The dangerous magic of archival and historiographical representations of enslaved women effectively renders them almost inanimate perpetually trapped within the enslaved free paradigm in which varied forms of socio-political freedoms are requisite for personhood in historical memory. So it's for this reason that I understand conjure and not just any manifestation of conjure, but rather acts that reside within the canon of retributive harm, a radically human act. So I understand these acts of harming that, that I will get into more when I talk about Josephine uh, as a way through which we can understand woman gendered individuals asserting their humanity and not just in historical space and time, but also in archive if we choose to acknowledge it, if we choose to really take seriously um, and think critically about this conjure, uh, conjure and magic and whatever we wanna call these acts because they've been called lots of things across space and time. Um, and we can think of them as um, uh, methodological categories through which we can, can really uh, think about interiority among the enslaved. So there you go. Um, so often called by names like voodoo, witchcraft, hoodoo, and black magic, conjure names a constellation of practices and logics aimed at healing or harming through the manipulation of objects and rituals. As a category, the term has long been described, uh, been used to describe the amorphous, I would argue extra institutional features of religion among African descendant people in what is now known as the United States. And so for scholars and observers, Conjure has been at once a pejorative way of racializing via religious categories. And on the other hand, a term of reclamation intended to capture the rights that elude legibility within um, the historiography, and really, I would argue, within the theor theoretical Christian field uh, of, of framework of African American religion. Um, and in this, you can also think about contemporary reclamation movements like hoodoo. So hoodoo is a, is a, um, a companion term to conjure uh, that has been recently picked up by practitioners as a way of reclaiming uh, these legacies from this pejorative a connotation. So as a practice conjure remained a salient feature of the religious landscape through the 20th century, only becoming less prominent, I, I would argue, following the deaths of formerly enslaved people once we get into kind of the 1930s and 40s, and with the atomization of conjuring practices and cosmologies into the more popular and, and well-known Christian denominations, pr primarily Afro-Protestant denominations, where healing assumed prominence. So if you think about uh, formulations like Pentecostalism, this is one of the places I'm thinking about where conjure is atomized and kind of gets distilled into. Um, yet the very indigeneity of the term, its obvious prominence in the parlance and thought of bond people and their descendants frequently preclude, preclude a critical examination into how the category functions in scholarship. So specifically how a term rooted in 
Western European lineages of metaphysical power and racist racializing concepts like fetishism became a repository for a range of Africana religious practices in North America. And I think in thinking about these kinds of moves, again, this is, I, when, we, when I'm using magic in, in various ways here, so I, I, I hope we can have a conversation about it. Um, but, but, you know, thinking about how these kinds of moves, how using a term with all these varied lineages, some, um, some derogatory, some not, and, and as a repository for thinking about a range of practices, gives us a type of opacity. It represents a type of opacity. Um, and by opacity, I mean kind of the counter hegemonic expression um, and, and claiming of it, it, opacity in kind of this classical sense, you know, something that is opaque. Um, but I would argue that it also becomes a, a, a way of thinking about opacity in the way that Charles Long, the scholar, historian of religion, thinks about opacity. opacity. Not a, and he does this in a way of, um, if you know uh, Du Boisian concepts of the double consciousness, Du Bois talks about the veil. The veil, uh, you know, of course, is something that segregates, but it also protects. There's an opacity to that veil that does not enable the oppressor to understand the interiority, the in interior logics, uh, cultural interior logics of the oppressed. And so this is how Long is using the, um, the, the concept of, of opacity as well in his work. Um, and I wanna think about conjure in this way as a, a counter hegemonic expression and claiming of humanity over and against the discursive and sociopolitical frameworks that strove to reduce black humanity to positions of subordination and enslavement. So in this way, you know, what I wanna, what I'm gonna do today with Josephine, um, it, it's not just about conjuring as an act, but rather enslaved humanity and the ways violent and coercive, the violent and coercive dimensions of enslaved and post-emancipation life appear in and guide the use of categories like conjure. So put differently, it is about the, the malevolent aspects of Black religiosity and to what extent um, the categories that we use to understand them, them can help or hinder the project of acknowledging and embracing the humanity of people in our work. Um, this humanity, this question of humanity is, is one of the many questions that I would argue is at the heart of, of a lot of work um, that is done about uh, the, work, the lives of marginalized people in, in the Americas, particularly um, the reductionistic production of Blackness in and through Western European religious studies categories. Um, so beginning with a brief examination into um, these kind of repertoires, I turn to a consideration of the archive um, and its role in reproducing methods, methodologies, and categories that render one-dimensional portraits of bond people and their immediate descendants. And so it, in this talk, I wanna think about the ways dangerous magic, so thinking about retributive acts of harm, conjuring, um, harming conjure, has the capacity to negate the dangerous magic of the archive. Um, and I do this through a, a case study of an, a really extraordinary person by the name of Josephine. So that all by way of introduction, I'm sorry for the very long introduction, but I get into talking about Josephine and I forget that I have to come to a point. Um, and so I, I want to, to give you the methodological, historiographical, and really theoret theoretical grounding for how I'm using this category of magic um, and why I think um, conjure itself is both um, illuminating and problematic in, in, in some ways. Um, so now to think about Josephine um, and at, here you just have her name because like so many, like the issue of me trying to find, um, find images of enslaved women that did not involve them being acted upon in harmful ways, um, we don't have images of many of the people that we study in the archive. Um, and so I always like to put a slide up just with the person's name to acknowledge what is lost in the archive, but also what's there. You know, there's a there's a real presence there. 
um, even if some of the things that we like to art access as um, le legitimate historical documents or legitimate uh, documents for the creation of scholarship is not there for these, these women. So this, the, the case of Josephine is based on really an, a very extraordinary record from uh, Bolivar County, uh, Mississippi. And it's a capital case in which two enslaved people, Josephine and George, uh, were tried for the poisoning of the Jones family, which consisted of Lafayette Jones, who is the, the male slaveholder, um, his second wife, Eliezer Jones, um, and uh, Lelia Virginia Jones. There's also a son there, um, but the son, as well as the other dinner guest, is not, are, are, they're not poisoned, so they're not really at the center of the case. Um, but on February 27, 1857, uh, Fayette, Elijah, and Lelia became violently ill immediately after drinking a tea allegedly prepared by Josephine, who was the family's new cook. And because the Joneses' guest, dinner guest, and um, the, who was Mr. Forbes, uh, and it sounds like a great kind of, uh, uh, you know, clue, um, episode of Clue or something like that, and that episode, the game of Clue, um, because you, you have all these actors and it's a, it's a big whodunit. Um, so I will probably shave down some of the details, but feel free to ask me because there is a lot of detail to this case. Um, so the Jones's son, who is a little bit older than their daughter um, and their dinner guest, Mr. Forbes, allegedly did not drink the tea. And this later heightened their suspicions that the tea was what made them sick. So Fayette only remained, the, who's the slaveholder, remained ill for a few days. Eliezer is going to claim to have suffered ill effects for two years, um, but Lelia, who was their 12 to 18 month old daughter, is going to uh, succumb to the effects of the poison. So this is why it becomes a capital case. Um, in the wake of the incident to enslaved people, Josephine and George, George was a longtime retainer, are going to be arrested and tried for homicide by poisoning. And so the reason why this case is really extraordinary is because in most Anglophone courts, um, enslaved people are not testifying. And so when I usually see cases, uh, even capital cases, there may be about three or four sentences um, and that's it. You know what they were being tried for, you know what the outcome was, what the punishment was, um, and pretty much they move on. The fact that this case, it drags on for uh, somewhere along the lines of four years and that we have extensive records of enslaved people documenting uh, or, or testifying is what makes it truly extraordinary. And I have a couple of theories about why this, uh, this might be uh, that we can talk about in the Q and A. Um, and so it's going to commence in not only a very an unusually long case, but one in which you have a series of mistrials. And so there's more and more details are gonna come out as these tri this trial progresses. And the case is not only, only gonna illuminate the myriad forms of intimate violence that are characteristic of not only enslaved life, but enslaved life, but in particular enslaved a uh, female life. But it's also going to illuminate the ways I would argue that um, bond women were using religious repertoires to respond to these acts of intimate violence. So in terms of intimate violence, uh, according to Lafayette Jones, Josephine had just arrived at the Jones plantation only two weeks before uh, the February 1857 poisoning. She had been purchased in New Orleans, which by the time uh, uh, the, by the time we get to 1857 is now going to be the largest site for the buying and selling of enslaved people in the country. And Jones goes there himself to buy him, uh, buy her. And so Josephine is a part of, um, you know, and you have the trail of tears here, which I'm going to explain. I, like I said, you can't help. The historian in me wants to give you a lot of context, so I have to restrain myself. Um, but Josephine is a part of the domestic slave trade. And so the reason why you have an image here of the Trail of Tears is uh, because the Trail of Tears and the rise of the domestic slave trade are uh, intimately linked. And so it, we, when we think about um, the ways opacity categories and the ways violence is being used and, and cultural contact, 
all of this stuff is circulating in the atmosphere, um, at least for how I think about these, these manifestations of culture. Um, so following the end of the Revolutionary War and at the end of the trans transatlantic slave trade in 1808, over 1 million people are going to be moved from the Upper South to the Lower South. Um, um, so Upper South being places like Virginia and the, the Chesapeake area um, to places like in the, the Lower South, like Georgia, South Carolina. Um, and these places are going to become more and more invested in slavery as the federal government authorizes the re forced removal of Cherokees, Choctaws, and Creek people in 1838. But of course, it begins much earlier than that. But that's, you know, the, the emblematic Trail of Tears. Um, after these many decades of ba long uh, battles, that, that um, removal is going to open up the West, the, the Western South uh, for, uh, in for the proliferation of slavery from uh, by upcountry planters. So for a very long time, the only places where you really see slavery in the South is gonna be along the coast. A lot of those planters are coming from, um, coming from the Caribbean. But once you get uh, the, this, the continued pressure upon the federal government and state governments to remove Native American people from their um, homelands uh, to the, the lands west of the Mississippi, um, and, and once you get that actually starting to happen, um, mu much of that, that land is going to be uh, cultivated by people who are farming cotton. And so the rise of cotton and this westward movement, this, this genocidal movement of people, dislocation of people from one place um, to the other is going to contribute to the significant uptick uptick in the demand for enslaved people. And this uptick, again, thinking about the human registers in which these things happen, is going to mean uh, moments of, of extreme disruption. So this is the moment where we, we see those images of people on the auction block. This is the moment we're in, uh, where many people even if they have had long uh, ties to families and uh, institutions on the coast are now going to be disrupted through these, this westward movement. Um, and so just to give you a sense of how disruptive this is, uh, notwithstanding the numbers. So um, after, you, after 1838, after the 12, Trail of Tears, um, the dislocation um, uh, of Native Americans is going to pave the way, the way for the rise of cotton, which is going to increase the demand for enslaved labor in places like Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama by almost 30% each year following the Louisiana Purchase. So year, so, so here, Louisiana Purchase is, is, is preceding this, but think about this in terms of this dislocation, this pressure is happening for a very, very long time. 1838 really is just kind of the um, climax that we think about, but really it's that pressure has been happening. People have been uh, being moved very slowly off of their land for a long time and year over year, 30% increases. And so much of the, the disruption of the antebellum period is going to be happening around these processes and you see how they're, they're interrelated. Um, and so according to Jones, um, and he gives a very dispassionate testimony, Josephine is going to seem a good deal dissatisfied at the purchase. She's gonna manifest her pleasure, uh, displeasure, not by any word or words, but by crying and taking on considerably during the sale. And so she's last known to have worked in Kentucky and was one of the nearly 75,000 enslaved people removed from that state by slaveholders. Uh, we really, I, I've done my best to track her down. Who or what she left behind is really unknown. I, I can't even track down how long she was in New Orleans prior to her sale. Um, but according to Jones, Josephine's distress is not over her removal from her family or whatever and whomever she's leaving behind, but rather the fact that her jewelry is, has gotten stolen by other enslaved people in her movement from Kentucky to New Orleans. Um, and this is why Josephine is a really interesting person because why and how she got this jewelry, um, it, I can speculate, you know, on, so, on one hand, she could have um, 
acquired this jewelry um, from her mistress. This is the least likely I would like to underscore. Someone could have just given it to her because she was a favored um, enslaved person, but that almost never happened. I would argue that most likely she was gifted it um, because she, she was a sexual consort of a someone's sexual consort at some point. This could have happened either before she got to New Orleans and Kentucky or during her tenure in New Orleans. Um, but she ended up in the slave markets regardless of whether or not she was favored or she had served in this role in, in, in the past. Um, and so for a woman who had enjoyed somewhat of an elevated status, um, sail in a yard alongside other bond people are, is really gonna serve as a bitter reminder of the tenuous nature of her life, regardless of her position or her status. And so even if her tears were just for her lost jewelry, um, the jewels represent more than financial loss. That, that's what I wanna underscore here. And so after her sale, she's gonna travel separately from Jones um, to Mississippi. And, and there are a couple of politics around her install, installation as a cook in the Jones household. Um, and I think it's gonna point to the intimate forms of violence to which they were subject. Um, and in this image here is one of an, an enslaved girl who is somewhere between 15 and 16 years old. And when we talk about intimate violence, we oftentimes are thinking primarily in terms of sexual violence. Um, but in this case, um, the case of Josephine, as in the case of this uh, young woman on the screen um, or young person on the screen, um, there, are, there are layers to this, these forms of intimate violence. So this uh, violence, these are, um, very severe burns going, uh, as you can see, along her scalp, her back, um, down her buttocks to such an extent that she, you see her perch precariously at the edge, on the edge of her chair. Um, she could not sit. And so um, this was inflicted upon her by her mistress, by the slaveholding um, woman uh, for some minor infraction. And so when we think about intimate violence, it's not just sexual violence. And these are the kinds of violences that um, uh, bond women in particular are, are much more subject to. And that contextualizes, I would argue, the ways they are going to respond uh, when we think about uh, retributive harm. Um, and so in, turn, in Josephine's case, only weeks before she's installed as a cook, the woman who, Elsie, the woman who was the Jones cook um, for the past decade had been removed very abruptly from her post. Um, and the reasons are not clear, but it's interest, what's really interesting um, is that she, Elsie, is the mother of a young enslaved woman who had recently given birth to what is described as a mulatto child. Um, and this is, this, this, the young woman, her name is Leith, is going to give birth to this child approximately 18 months before her mother will be removed from her post as a cook. Um, so Josephine, in the course of this case, Josephine's defense is not going to ask whether or not Jones fathered uh, Leith's child, but there is going to be a similar line of questioning uh, during the cross-examination that is really going to all but implicate the slaveholder. And so the defense is going to ask Jones whether he had, quote, for some time been in the habit of sexual intercourse with um, another young woman, a third young woman on the estate, and if, quote, in New Orleans and on the afternoon of the day before the poisoning, he had had sexual intercourse with Josephine. So what's going to happen, the state is going to object to the questions. They're going to be sustained. He's never going to answer. But the record silences amplify Jones's culpability. So without question, I would argue Fayette Jones routinely sexually assaulted the bond women on his plantation. Um, and his known assaults of, of this young woman, Eliza, Leith, and then Josephine heightened the probability that um, he, he fathered the, the child in question. And so this sexually predatory behavior is also going to set the stage not only for Josephine's potential poisoning, but interestingly, Elsie, the woman, uh, the, the, the former cook, is also going to be accused of, of poisoning Jones's first wife. And actually, um, even though not directly linked to the first wife's death, um, somehow implicated in it. And so this is, these are all the details that come out um, 
during this, this four-year case. There are, again, lots of little intricacies, but this gives us a, a really good sense, uh, I would argue, of how common these types of suspicions were, particularly around enslaved women who had more access to um, slaveholders' foods. Um, but the reason why there's so much um, ambiguity around it um, is because poisoning is very difficult um, to prove. Um, and so uh, part of the reason why this is gonna go back and forth is because poisoning looks a whole lot like a lot of other illnesses at this time. And so what the, the, the case we get is um, they are trying to build motive. And in order to, to suggest that Josephine had a motive, this case really had to go deep into the kinds of violences um, that she was being subjected to. So on the morning of the poisoning, Eliezer Jones, which is Jones's 20 something second wife, is gonna testify that Josephine prepared something very badly. And when confronted, Josephine quote, replied impudently and saucily. And so she's gonna report this impudence to her husband, and then he's going to use a cowhide or a switch to whip Josephine in turn. And according to Fayette Jones, the slaveholder, she's, Josephine is going to quote, seem vexed about the whipping, and she's gonna throw her head around to her shoulder to see the cuts. Um, and this is why I love Josephine so much, because she is obviously outraged by this, this treatment, which I think, again, suggests that she is not accustomed to it. And I would argue that perhaps she's not accustomed to cooking, which is why the food was cooked poorly. Um, if it was in fact cooked poorly, she might not actually be a cook. Um, and so after she does, she she makes this, this scene after, you know, rightfully so being beaten, um, she, she returns to the kitchen and then Eliza Jones, is the, the, the wife, is going to um, call her and, and ask her to do something. And she says, instead of responding, Josephine is going to turn her back on her, make a face, and turn over a chair. Um, again, why she's one of my favorite people in the archive. Um, so this time, the mistress is going to call the overseer to whip Josephine. And so not even two hours after ordering um, after ordering her whipped by her husband, um, she's going to be whipped again by an overseer. Um, and then the mistress is going to appeal to her to prepare her dinner. And of course, this is going to be the dinner at which um, they are allegedly poisoned. Um, so, you know, a couple of things about intimate violence, because what this reveals is, to, you know, to the mistress, and according to her testimony, the mistress is going to say Josephine seemed to be in a good humor by the next time she encountered her. Um, but again, these forms of violences are oftentimes go unnoted by slaveholders, which again is a part of the archive of, I would not argue it's dehumanization, it's altered humanity. Um, it's, it's part of the art of, of humanity that can be violated consistently. Um, and so part of the reasons why we get these depictions, um, I think in ways that are, are considered offhand is because it was so mundane. These were mundane, routine, uh, even, in, even in their being spectacular, these were mundane acts uh, of violence, routinized acts of violence um, inflicted upon them. So um, in the historiography of resistance to American enslavement, more spectacular acts like insurrection or dangerous acts like absconding are oftentimes assumed center stage. However, ensl ens enslaved women are the least likely to participate in either act on account of the webs of interdependency that often mired them more thoroughly in systems of slavery. And so I wanna be clear Enslaved males oftentimes often, uh, oftentimes neglected to run away on account of familial ties. Um, but by far, uh, women's ways of responding to their enslavement varied on account um, uh, of the often dire consequences of open defiance for themselves and their families. Thus, acts like poisoning constitute an opportunity cons to consider how um, uh, to consider forms of, of harming practices that while not unique to females gendered women uh, within the binary, 
were at least more marked along gender lines due to the, the conditions of enslavement. And so due to their roles of, of midwife, uh, their roles as midwives and midwives roles as the primary arbiters and keepers of pharmacological knowledge within a number of, of communities, enslaved women were oftentimes credited as the progenitors of conjuring knowledge within enslaved communities. And this knowledge remained a part of female communities anchored in uh, oftentimes reproductive knowledge systems. So uh, I talk about in my first book, how birthing spaces become these, these centers of, of, of female knowledge and ritual centers, because a lot of these, these uh, more covert knowledges are around reproductive systems, because this is, this is gonna be a largely untouched realm of enslaved female experience. One where surveillance, while still there, it's always a constant, it's, it's nowhere near as heavy as in other aspects of their, their lives. Um, and so, um, you know, oftentimes these, these kinds of acts uh, are oftentimes situated in kind of broadly as resistance in the historiography, historiography of Southern slavery. Uh, slavery. Um, poisoning really required knowledge of, of chemicals and um, botany, the properties of substance, substance, substances required to induce desi desired effects. Um, and it resided, resided within an ethical system of conjure that included acts of healing and harm. And when I say ethical systems of conjure, I mean, um, there, had, there were ethical rubrics that people used to determine how and when they deployed these acts. Um, and, and overwhelmingly, we see the discussion of conjure is ha happens and these types of harming acts happen around Obia and Jamaica um, and places where they're going to be more criminalized. Um, however, I, I would argue that, um, you know, the myriad atrocities of, of slavery expanded and nuanced the purposes and effects of religious harming. So when we think about religious harming, it offers us a window, not only into how people are responding to these more spectacular acts that we know in the archive, but also how they're responding to one another. Um, and I would argue that revenge might certainly fall within the category of religious harm um, in light of the myriad, you know, violences inflicted, the intimate violences, it might be more apt to understand uh, acts of poisoning like Josephine's within a system of justice adjudicated and enacted by enslaved women in particular. So that is a part of the ethics of, con of conjure. Um, and one of the ways I think we can think about enslaved women, so I think conjure offers us a window um, into thinking about interiority among enslaved people. But in when we think about poisoning as an act within this larger repertoire, and one that seems to be assigned or, or um, um, uh, what's, what's the word? Not assigned, but um, one that is attributed more, more frequently to females. Um, I think we can, we, what starts to emerge is sort of a gendered kind of ethic of conjure and one where we can think about also a gendered ethic of harm um, around conjure and one that speaks, is in dialogue with these more spectacular acts. Here you have a depiction of um, uh, the massacre in Virginia, the very famous uh, Nat Turner's uh, insurrection, which uh, over and over again in the historiography of slavery, these are the kinds of acts that we use to uh, headline the conversation about uh, modes of resistance to enslavement. So to conclude, I, I end here with um, kind of a, a couple of provocations. Um, and um, I love this image because Again, when we think about opacity, I think this, this image very beautifully um, depicts opacity. There's something about the image of this formerly, this is an actual historical image of a formerly enslaved woman. Um, and just her look is highly contemplative. And I think there, there's just a range, a wealth of knowledge um, and um, um, not only knowledge, but um, religious epistemologies uh, and that are, are housed behind the lives and, and the eyes, um, the archival lives of enslaved women. So here, conjure was not merely something people attended to in times of crisis, 
but I would argue was in fact a regulatory force among bond people, a threat of the human capacity for retribution, aggression, and in some cases pettiness, in spite of the rigors that united them. Thus conjuring practice, practices offer a window into bond women's, uh, bond people's generally and bond women's in particular, preoccupations, their conflicts, and other features of relationality that are more difficult to access via the archive. Conjuring practices are an archive of materiality, ethics, ritual, and the dynamics of power among a group whose pervasive silences in the historical record often precludes a window into these more interior aspects of their lives. Yet the paradox of the archive is that its very creation and the documents and artifacts of which it is composed are a production of Western European and white American epistemological orientations and material concerns. It was the seeming anomaly of black people's conjuring and its utility in the project of demarcating whiteness vis-a-vis -vis blackness that gave historical life to the obfuscating typologies, things like conjure, superstition, fetishism versus religion. Therefore, accessing the opaque elements of religion among the enslaved or interiority among the enslaved requires methods and methodologies invested in the scholarly reconstruction and acknowledgement of enslaved people's humanity outside of the black, white, enslaved free dialectics. Reading for the multidimensionality intrinsic to human life, and this, by this I mean this is inclusive of but not limited to ideals such as justice and wholeness, as well as less lofty expressions of jealousy, greed, and violence brings the humanity of US bond people uh, into greater focus. In this way, examining harming acts of conjure offer one route to grappling with opacity in the historical methods, uh, ar and archives, and methodologies um, that scholars use to understand the lives of the enslaved and the formerly enslaved. Finally, attending to the less lofty, more visceral and problematic aspects of enslaved life, attending to people like Josephine, whose ambiguity just jumps out of the record because she never, she's never convicted of it, of, 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 of the crime. Remarkably, I have no idea. I don't see any record of her being convicted of it. Um, and I even the one time uh, I, I cross referenced it with a legal scholar who I said, maybe they know more about how to read legal documents and, and what the law might have said. And same trail did not find any evidence that she's ever uh, convicted. So when we're attending to um, people like Josephine, who had her enslaved, the people who testified most um, readily against her were her fellow enslaved people. The people who marked her as evil, who said that she was a conjure woman in this very derogatory fashion <clears throat> and said that she absolutely did it somehow, um, were her enslaved people, were, were her the people uh, with whom she lived and worked if, if only for two weeks. Um, and those who came to her defense were her former slaveholders. So this is again, this is a part of the complexity of these individuals. The way she's situated within her community was not as a heroine. Um, and so what do, what do we do with, how, we, how do we think about these, uh, these, mo these this relationality um, and, and the ways that enslaved people oftentimes um, derogated conjure amongst themselves or certain types of conjure amongst themselves, the ways they deployed it against and, and, and um, uh, in service to one another. Um, there are just all these complexities to it. So attending to these less lofty and more visceral and problematic aspects of enslaved life in the application and creation of categories opens up a range of possibilities for overcoming the de dehumanizing reductionism of the slave in, in any sort of uh, manifestation of enslaved people's lives. Uh, and it does so in favor of approaches that acknowledge the diverse personalities, inclinations, and repertoires of the people who bore the designation of slave. And so in an attempt to write against the over-determining influence of derogate, uh, derogatory Western European understandings of Black practices and Black religions, I would argue that scholars oftentimes diminish um, the, the petty jealousies, the greed, the coercion that is endemic to life 
under violent circumstances in favor of interpretations that are largely redemptive and idealistic. And while this is certainly understandable given scholars and observers historical vilification of, of Africana religions and, and you know, Black people in, more generally, um, um, you know, opacity demands a, a bracketing of the external white gaze and prioritization of the social and cosmological worlds of African descended peoples in the study of religion and enslaved life. So conjure as a practice and a category provides a case study of the double-edged nature of the archives and their possibilities. Though created because of the conspicuous difference of Africana practice and used to justify racist hierarchies, archives documenting bond people's conjuring practices offers a means through which the voices of the enslaved assert themselves nonetheless, and it asserts themselves through their practices. Attentiveness to these voices, to these practices, over and against the circumstances under which they appear, enable scholars of religion to encounter the complexity of thought, emotional registers and modes of human relationality evinced in one woman's exercises of the dangerous magic of conjure. Thank you. Alexis, thank you so much. That was um, really engaging, um, wonderful um, storytelling and um, really helpful conceptual frames for us to think through a number of issues. Um, so I'm gonna get us started for a few minutes and, and just uh, we can we can have a bit of a conversation, but let me just um, emphasize again to the audience, please do feel free to put your questions into the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen. I know we have um, several, uh, several regular attendees of this seminar, a, a, a bunch of fantastic um, students, uh, here from Columbia and from uh, elsewhere who have been attending. And I, I warmly encourage them, and indeed everyone, to, to pose, uh, pose questions. Um, but I will get us, I will get us started. Um, I, I, I've got so many questions, I'll try to keep them focused, but maybe just on the, the specifics of the case of Josephine um, a bit more. Um, I think it would be really interesting to hear more about, well, the, what, you, you talked about what the archive has and, and doesn't have in, 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 you know, uh, in, in very general terms. I wonder if you can tell us a bit more specifically, in, especially in terms of say the testimonies or, or the, the court records, what kinds of voices emerge? Um, and I was particularly intrigued to hear that it was the the fellow enslaved uh, within the the household uh, who were the most readily willing to to label Josephine a conjurer, and the most robust defense from her former slaveholders. Right. So this is a a really interesting dynamic, and I I wonder does the does the archival record contain what what kinds of imageries or, or, or terms does it contain? What kind of emotions and affects come across in, in the record? Um, it would just be, I think, really, really interesting to hear that, that level of, of, um, of detail, if, if it exists. No, absolutely. Thank you for that. And yeah, I was, I, I crammed a lot into this talk because um, I tend not to, I can't, for whatever reason, my mind works in, in, mysterious ways. And so I can never just focus on one thing. Um, and I'm always thinking about categories, but this case really is fascinating for, because, so A, again, I'd like, it's a completely anom anomalous case. I, I have, the fact that I have more than a page of, of records on this particular case is what makes it so extraordinary. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the specifics of the case. So Josephine, um, we do have Josephine's voice. You have a couple of the reasons why I know the things about Elsie, because she's one of the people who's de deposed the former cook. A lot of enslaved people are on the, the, um, the farm are going to be deposed as well. 
And I, for whatever reason, Josephine has defense attorneys. I have no, again, I, I, I have no idea how or why she does. Um, and they're, they're quite good. I, I mean, I, when you read the case, they are asking, they're asking really tough questions. Um, and, and so in terms of her former slaveholders, they're going to, in ter- uh, they're going to, Josephine was a nurse for them in Paducah, Kentucky. Um, they, and as a nurse, she's likely taking care of younger children. Um, it does not give me a sense of how long she worked for them. Um, it just says that that was her last known employer. Um, and again, I don't know when she gets to New Orleans and I don't know why she has jewelry. Um, so lots of things I don't know, but, um, because everybody on the farm is going to be deposed overwhelmingly. I mean, no, every, because it, so a few things, it's a kind of an either who done it and somebody had to have done it. So it's either George, uh, who is this longtime family retainer, or Josephine, who's someone who just got to the community two weeks ago. So this could be one of the reasons why enslaved people are rallying against Josephine, because George is someone they, they've known for a long time, and they knew that somebody had to be accused of it. And if in that case, they thought it should be Josephine. And to be quite honest, I feel like Josephine did do it, <laughs> um, especially because there are a few things that um, about the case. So George, it comes out, is not literate, and Josephine is. She uses rat poison, so she's actually not, um, or that's what they it resembles. Um, it, but what rat poisoning, um, well, first they say it's, it's uh, strike nine, um, and, but then they bring in Oxford specialists in from Oxford University. I, I, again, this case just continues to, to blow my mind. I have no idea why they're doing this in Mississippi of all places, but they bring a specialist in from Oxford to examine the contents of the teapot that was used. And apparently the specialist finds blue crystals, um, on the bottom of the, the, um, of the, um, teapot. And then also uh, they bring another physician in to discuss the um, the symptoms, the victim symptoms. And this, together with the teapot, they say this is consistent with arsenic poisoning. Um, and so the question becomes, well, where would they get these substances from? The reason why George is implicated is because George apparently found something that is poison in, a gra- in the mud the year before. The only reason they know this is because um, he takes it to the overseer because he's not literate and he asks him what it is and the overseer, t- the overseer tells him. Now, apparently George, when he's testifying says, Josephine who can read, sees it in his, his um, room when she comes in one day and she takes it from him. So this is why the two of them are, are both implicated because it's last known to have been in his possession, but according to him, she takes it. Um, and he he begs, he claims ignorance, saying, you know, I was told what it is, but I, you know, I don't really know what it is, which could or may or may not be true. Um, whereas we know Josephine is literate, is literate, so she she apparently takes it. So there are um this is why I think you you have a lot of there's a lot of expert. Test testimony, again, like I said before, because um, the fee, the reason why you're going to see this a lot less. So if we pull out a little bit from Josephine and um, just kind of think about the larger context of poisoning. So Diana Payton um, has written about poisoning. She talks about it in, in the Caribbean and in connection to um, Virginia in particular. And she notes that in Virginia, I, enslaved women are overwhelmingly being prosecuted for poisoning. But the problem is poisoning substantiates uh, these, the, the abolitionist claim that enslaved people are unhappy. And there, act, there is active resistance beyond just the insurrections that they're of course going to attribute to some sort of mental illness. Um, and, and, and just people being more wayward, spiritually wayward, uh, misled, they have all these justifications. Whereas poisoning, if it's happening and it's rampant, 
um, then that means there's more widespread dis, um, widespread um, um, uh, animus towards uh, in slaveholders. And so, um, you know, the, the, there is, I say all this to say, there is a vested interest in making sure that anything that looks like poisoning that is prosecuted is indeed poisoning. And oftentimes because poisoning can masquerade as another illness. So they talk about, um, let me see if I have it in my notes. There's a particular illness that it, it looks a lot like, uh, I think they call it like Asiatic typhus or something like that. It's some very strange uh, kind of racist term, but um, they say it looks a lot like that illness um, or just some general kind of um, some general uh, stomach ailment. And so you oftentimes just can't prove poisoning. So this is why you get so many voices in this case. There's so much circumstance. There's so much building up of evidence because A, they want to actually prove that she did poison them because the, there are ramifications in terms of the sociocultural context and the legal context. But also there, there are lots of interests at work in the case. Um, so yeah, there, you know, the, the, I, that's my only kind of, thought about why enslaved people would be against her. Um, and then also, yeah, conjure, this is a part of, you know, the last point I'll make very quickly, the opacity of conjure. Um, it, 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 enslaved people are very good at speaking in multiple registers. And so there are going to, you know, I think there are multiple registers being spoken here in term, even just in the conversation between enslaved people and the record. Um, I don't think the, rec the record is all, all externally focused. Um, and because conjure is an opaque, pra uh, opaque practice, um, there are, I, I think there is a vested interest among enslaved people in ensuring that she's viewed as anomalous amongst them in this practice so that, you know, they can continue to do what they do. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of motivate motives here around who speaks and who doesn't and what they say when they do speak. Um, do you want me to answer this? No, no, that's that's great. No, I'll well, um, okay. Uh, I, I I yeah, I mean, I, I you know, one of the other things I was thinking was um, how did this even get into a courtroom? I mean, you know, what what would have you know extrajudicial. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, discipline was, was, was not unheard of mm -hmm. in 18th and, and, and indeed down to the present day. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, the astonishing fact that this actually went through the, the legal system to say mm -hmm. nothing of, you know, experts, expert witnesses and, and, a and a competent defense. I mean, it's, it's astonishing really, um, you know, and remind us where, where is this, where is the, the where are the documents for this? Uh, for this case. Document, where are these documents? Let me see, because this is just one document. It's in the, it's in the, um, you mean where are they physically housed? Yeah, yeah, like which archive? Okay, let me, I would have to pull that out. Where are they physically housed? Because they're just one set of documents. Sorry, let me, let me pull that up in uh, my, uh, I have to actually go to my notes because this case is, um, let me see, where is it? I want to say it's in like a Mississippi, a Mississippi State Archives. Right. Okay. Um, but I, I can I can verify that. I just need to find it. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. It's in the, it's the it's basically it's the Mississippi. These are the um, the criminal cases from 1818 to 1872. Mm -hmm. So they are, you can, they are already compiled like it on um, there, you know, you can get them in microform or you can, um, I don't know where the actual, cause I, I read it, you know, the digital version. Mm -hmm. um, but well, I don't know a, where yeah. it actually ha housed. That's a, that's a, that's a, um, and yeah, I mean that, that, um, well, I have some methodological questions. I mean, it's of course we are in the 21st century, yeah, so a lot of archival work is now um, online. 
Um, but maybe we can get to 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 those questions in in, in a few minutes. But I, I just one more one more question about the the case, and then maybe some of the methods and concepts. And then there are a few questions now. And please, those of you in the audience, uh, we have a few questions in the queue. But please feel free to to add to add yours. Um, in in terms of so um, it, it's interesting that Josephine seems the kind of classic scapegoat character figure, right? I mean, and which is so um, common within um, the discourse and histories of, of witchcraft and witchcraft accusations, right? The pointing of a finger. Uh, and it's interesting that in this case, it's to the, to the stranger, right? And to the stranger who has certain capabilities, that is literacy. I mean, these, these are just really interesting elements. Um, and I, you know, it, it's, um, you know, th well, this maybe gets to one of the questions that, that came up and I might um, thread a couple more of my own in, but um, uh, one of the questions from uh, a, a grad student here at Columbia, Elvira, um, asks, um, this was really fascinating. Have you seen allegations of conjuring come up in other trials or legal cases not related to poisoning? Uh, I wonder what other forms conjuring could take. Yeah, so what are the, what are the ways in which conjuring gets gets recognized as that? And and you mentioned that this was a, a I think you put it as a, a kind of indigenous term, that is to say, a term that practitioners might use. But is this the kind of term that would have come up in the did it come up in the trial as that or? But in any case, the the, the broader question of um, are there other um, other trials or legal cases not related to poisoning in which conjuring comes up? So, you know, I think the two, what your question about method or methodology in particular is, is related to this. So not really, no. Um, the interesting thing, conjure doesn't come up at all in this case. And the reason, so the interesting thing and the problematic thing about conjure or any sort of practice like this in the United States, as it is assigned or thought about in relationship to African descendant people. It's a high, it's a highly visible term. It's a, a, a very widely used colloquial term, especially in its application to African descendant people post, um, you know, I would conjure is heavily used by the 19th century. You see it kind of starting, I, I would argue in the 18th century kind of being used more like, because conjure is a term that comes out of Western Europe, like it's it's a term that comes out of the Anglophone world. Um, so conjure is not originally just kind of something that African descended people did, but it becomes the term that sticks with uh, their practices most most um, for the I, for the longest length of time. So to to the question, um, no, this is one of the ways that I am trying to um, address the opacity of conjure itself. Because there are a range, conjure is sort of this, it's an indigenous term, but I think there are meanings that need to be parsed even in its indigenous parlance. I think, again, this is a part of the multiple registers in which people are speaking. So when they say conjure, it can be everything from, um, it, it's conjure resides, um, it could be everything from medicine you know, to, um, you know, and actual practices of healing medicine to um, harming medicine. Um, and, and one of the ways I was recently talking to Ross Michael Brown about this, and I think he very, um, very um, accurately situated it within the West and West Central African cosmological context in which all of these acts reside within kind of the same field. So you are deploying similar practices just towards different ends. Um, and so that means you could use one term to describe a host of practices. Um, and people oftentimes did because it, for them, they understood what they were talking about. Um, whereas for us, he, that's the methodological problem. That's part of the opacity of conjure. When they say conjure, they mean a lot of things. And so I'm just kind of trying to parse through what they mean. But it, it, so... That's a piece of the methodological problem. On the other hand, um, you know, um, it, 
his, the, the historical problem of conjure is that, you know, after Salem, and I, I would say like maybe about three decades after Salem, like immediately after Salem, you get this, this declaration, okay, witchcraft isn't real. These things are not real. You, you should not accuse anybody of the, the, you know, there is no verifiable basis for these practices. However, um, there is a there there. That's, that's one thing I say that there, there is, continues to be fear. Um, and the fear is what comes up in the, the legal archive. So they do not adjudicate anything called conjure because that would suggest that there is a, a material reality that is conjure. It's, so, and this is over and against places like Jamaica where they are actually prosecuting obia. Um, because, the, you know, they're talking about if you have bones in your possession, if you have feathers in your possession, then you are practicing obia. You don't see that as much here. You see it a little bit in South Carolina, but that still that it's 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 not a heavy, um, heavily regulated, definitely not to the scale that you see in the Caribbean. Um, so but so the question, the methodological question and the, you know, is how do you discern a phenomena that is felt in the archive. There's real fear of this. And I recently talked about, you see people um, not so much in um, legal records, but in more of like newspapers. So they don't, because you can't, you're not trying people for this because again, it's not a thing we acknowledge in the law. But in the, the newspapers, you see, um, lots of, you know, I shouldn't say lots, you see sprinklings of people uh, accusing enslaved women of poisoning. You also see this wonderful record of, you know, um, kind of the commercial and uh, popular interests and things like necromancy, you know, you, you see all that stuff still circulating. Um, and then the suspicion, the, the kind of fear element is there um, in, in this one case, it was not a legal case. He tried to make it a legal case, but he was unsuccessful. This, this slaveholder accuses his, uh, an enslaved woman on, that, um, on his farm of poison, trying to poison him uh, or conjure him. Now he does use the language of conjure multiple times. And he ends up, the only reason this is marked is because he ends up on his roof and he's you know, having a nervous breakdown around, around this st stuff, um, saying that I know she's trying to kill me. Uh, and everybody's saying, and, and the way it's written up is like, oh, you know, old man, whoever is, you know, was on his roof and kind of going a little bit crazy. And he keeps up with this claim that she's trying to kill him. Um, and so you have sprinklings of that that let me know that th there is something that they are afraid of. Um, but no, it's not in the legal record. So what I'm trying to do is kind of break down in terms of how I study these things. What is, what is it that they're afraid of? Um, what are, or what is it that they're accessing? Because sometimes it's not even fear. Sometimes they're actually coming for help in terms of healing medicine. Mm. Um, so there, I think there are lots of ways to kind of break it down. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. A very quick question from um, Chazelle. Uh, who just wanted the name of the scholar you've been talking with about the meaning of conjure. You mentioned someone you were um, corresponding with recently. Oh, Roz Michael Brown. Is okay. that, is that who? Maybe we can put that in. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yes. Roz Michael Brown. Yes. He wrote, well, he doesn't write about conjure in particular, but we were talking about the, the West and West Central African cosmological context in which all of these things resided. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think um, who you would, who, if you want a written kind of text on that. Um, his text would be fantastic for thinking about that context in, in the Americas. Um, it's, and he, he works on Congo and the low country and it's, it's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's interesting, you know, that um, the, the question of intimacy is also really interesting here. And you, you brought it out with respect to the, the different forms of intimate violence. And I guess I just, I'll, I'll leave this <laughs> as, as more like a, 
comment um, to kind of take away maybe, because um, I want to get to the audience questions, but there's a, um, there's a passage in, in The Souls of Black Folk where Du Bois is reflecting on the shift that takes place um, after the Civil War um, in terms of the relations between uh, whites and blacks. And he talks about the, the intimacy that obtains in the antebellum South because of the proximity, right? With the household, with the farm. And he's reflecting with his kind of sociological, you know, hat on about how segregation takes away that intimacy, right? And, and creates a kind of um, complete alienation between white and black um, communities, even within say a given, a given town, right? So it's the kind of the shift in the patterns of connection or, or dynamics of connection that people have. And for Du Bois, it hinges on this idea of a certain, of a certain kind of intimacy, right? Um, but I think that's, it's interesting because, you know, so much of the literature on magic and witchcraft to include from Central Africa um, focuses on the fact or makes the argument that magic and witchcraft is practiced in relation to your intimates, right? That you don't, you don't have to either fear magic from, from, a, from someone who's not part of your social world um, or, and you also wouldn't go to someone outside of your social world for the, the helpful kind. So there's this sense that, it, that magic indexes or marks a certain kind of proximity and familiarity with a group of people. And I, I, I mean, this is the kind of this reflection and it's probably too big to think about now, but it would be interesting to think about, um, you know, the ways in which conjuring either continues you know, after the Civil War and you know, into the into the Jim Crow era, um, into the 20th century, whether it continues as this uh, either specter or 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 discursive formation that people invoke, or not, when it comes to cases involving um, interracial violence, right? If they make it, if it makes it to the courts, and it would just be you know interesting to think about whether because of the lack of, if, if the absence of the kinds of intimacies that Josephine had with her, with the Joneses, right? Whether that would affect. So it's just, it's a, a question or a provocation to think about the relationship between intimacy and conjure or magic and the kinds of social connections we have. But I'm gonna leave, I'm just gonna let, I'm gonna let that sit with you because I, I do wanna get to the questions from the audience. Um, there's some great ones. Um, so uh, one is from Justin Linz, who is a um, fantastic PhD student at NYU. Um, are you interested in thinking about conjure and or poisoning as expertise or expert knowledge? I think this is a compelling frame for analyzing magic, especially the magic of subaltern groups. But I wonder if that is a line of inquiry you want to pursue with Josephine's case and why or why not? Yeah, no, certainly it's, 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 it's not just expert knowledge, it's, it's, it's intergenerational knowledge. I mean, if you think about, you know, how people come to knowledge of conjure, they, they usually have a lineage, there's a genealogy that they, they reference. Um, and, you know, one really interesting thing, it, you know, one thing I, I don't just think about about it in terms of knowledge in the intellectual sense, because I think there is, that is one way, I think, to understand it epistemologically. Another way is knowledge in the very embodied sense, because in so, in, in a number of the West African cultures that I, I study, it's about blood. It's literally, you have a capacity to do different things because you inherit it genetically. It's not just about knowledge that is transmitted in intellectually. Um, there, people, certain people have different capacities because of their because of their genealogy, but also because of circumstances around their birth, 
Um, so it's, it's multi, it's a sociocultural knowledge, you know, it's, 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 there are lots of ways I think to think about it as expert, uh, expertise, but expertise that goes beyond the intellectual solely. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely how I'm thinking about it. In Josephine's case, I don't know where she gets the knowledge, but I do think that, um, communally, there, there are lots of places, even if we're just thinking about it in sort of a um, kind of a sociocultural exchange um, and, and osmosis sort of just being in these contexts where people discuss these things. Um, you know, her being in New Orleans is gonna be really significant if I could ever determine how long she was there. Yeah, I know um, if, if, yeah. Uh, be wonderful to magic up some other sources on that. Um, but uh, so thank you for that. So um, another question from uh, one from Dave Collins, um, how might conjuring practice interact with or contribute to the conjurer's sense of self and identity? Uh, I'm a long time meditator and I'm thinking of how my practice helps me know that my identity as suggested by my society in effect isn't the real me. Um, that's a good, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not really sure how, so, you know, one of the, the problems with the sources is that I don't know how they understand this in a very interior way. Um, what I'm doing is reading practices and I'm reading the consequences for, our, as a way to, to access how they might have used it, the conditions under which they might have uh, deployed it, how they might they might have understood their deployments, but there there really is no hard and fast way for me to know how kind of whether or not this is shaping them in terms of how they know um, themselves in a more intimate or interior or kind of contemplative way. I mean, one thing I will say is, I think there's a sense of situate like there is a sense of position that goes along with the expertise, certain levels of expertise. So in some ways we can think about identity um, and um, certain capacities to deploy um, ritual practices that are subsumed under the categories of magic or conjure or whatever they're called at the time. Um, but I, I would say that's only in the case of people who are, um, specialists. Conjure is so ubiquitous that I think a lot of people use it, but they dabble, you know, they, they're not, it's, you know, it's like your grandmother who gives you really good advice, but she's not a therapist, you know, so that kind of thing. But that's, you know, that's an interesting question to think about. Wonderful, thank you. So um, the next question is from Seth Gators. Um, for you, does the category of the opaque reach beyond what the category of religion signifies? Is there a sort of liability clause with the ways that you're using the category of religion where you're conscious that it remains an insufficient term in referring to the interior lives of the formerly enslaved? Sorry, let me, let me, I have to look at that question because I'm mm -hmm. missing the bat, the second part of it. They're like, how's went? Do you find the category of a peg reaches beyond what the category of religion signifies? Um, hmm, does it reach beyond what the category of religion signifies? Let me think about that. Mm, mm, I, th I would probably say no. Um, with the ways that you're using the category of religion, where you're conscious that it remains an instant and we're friendly into the front and say, um, no, I, I, you know, I, I think there's a yes and there's a no to that question, that answer, my answer to that, because I, I think in some ways all categories are just approximations, but we have to use them because we're trying to describe, we're trying to get at an experience. Um, I think religion is sufficient in the same way medicine is sufficient in a West African cosmological context to, to contain things like a range of acts um, that go beyond how the term is being defined in um, particular contexts. I think, um, at least for me, I should say, for me, 
epistemologically, it's important for the scholar to push into the context of the people that they're studying to define the terminology that they're using. And so for me, my definition of religion is capacious enough um, to contain the, the kinds of formulations I'm looking at. Um, yeah, so I, you know, and I, I do think opacity for me, um, if I'm getting at your, your question, um, it doesn't extend beyond religion. For me, it, it just, op opacity is a feature of the religious strivings of African descendant people. It's, it's just a necessary component of it because of the historical conditions into which they are forced to formulate, you know, and understand the English term religion. Um, so it, their ways of approaching the category are always opaque, um, or I shouldn't say always, but seem to be, at least especially in the historical moments that I study, um, opacity is just a feature of religiosity. Um, but it's necessary for a lot of reasons. But I, and I think it's not just necessary. It's also just, it, it's their cosmological orientation. It's the orientation from which they emerge in many of their contexts in West and West Central Africa. Um, you know, things are hidden. Knowledge is, there are certain layers of knowledge are hidden. And that's just how it goes. You get access to knowledge as you go through certain ritual processes and, and reach certain milestones and prove yourself worthy. You, everybody does not have universal access to knowledges. And, and even if you think you do, there's an, a level of opacity there. Um, so for me, I, I kind of, you know, I'm trying, I'm working, I'm doing my best to, um, to orient my definitions in those kinds of cosmological kind of ways of, of approaching um, phenomena that we term religious. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, for me, you know, I use religion, but I, I think there, you can make a case for other terms. Okay, well, um, that was uh, really fantastic. Thank you so much. We just have um, one more minute, just very quickly. Um, so this is your second, second book project. Um, and um, I wonder if you can just um, share with us you know how the, you know, how the way in which you're you're writing this project um, is kind of building on your your first and and maybe also departing from it. I mean to get a sense of um, as a, as an author because um, you know we have some um, authors in the audience and 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 grad students who are going to be writing dissertations and books. Um, so uh, I thought it would be helpful just to end with some reflections on, on you know, how you're approaching this project in a, in a way that's kind of building on your earlier work, but also maybe distinctive from it. No, I love Very that. that that's such a great question. Um, yeah, so, so actually I started being really interested in um, this kind of stuff in grad school. So I, I wrote and did a massive bibliography on witchcraft in America. Um, and I did, I paid particular attention to the ways Africans and African descendant peoples were being understood or not in the historiography. And um, that work actually is, it, that's what started it. And so in the, in the first book, in the dissertation, it's just a, a chapter. Um, and I'm not, I'm working with, um, you know, the, the sacred imagination. So I'm not even working with kind of the phenomena, the ritual practices themselves. I'm thinking about the, the whole world that kind of constructs it or, or, or contextualizes the practices. That's a better way to say it. Um, and so, it, you know, it just, it's kind of been a, a steady burn. And it's, it's, it's the practice that I think a lot of, um, you know, our, our um, grad school professors kind of, the really good ones tell us, you know, just keep, writing down your ideas because you have no idea what you'll come back to and, and, and what will inspire you. And so as I was kind of doing the dissertation and then really just you know getting into the work of finishing the first book, my love and my interest in this just continued to grow. Um, and so that the second project just just was there for me, uh, waiting for me. And so in the in the thinking process, um, I was already in a space um, 
since grad school, since before I even wrote the dissertation to think about this project. Um, but in the, the transitional process, in terms of, you know, the, the lessons I learned in terms of method and methodology in creating my first book is, are really the ones I'm still deploying here. And just not not limiting myself to how things have always been done. You know, part of the fun of research for me is just that, you know, we get to create. It's really a creative labor. Uh, we create how we do the work. We create the questions. Um, and so I really, honestly, allowing myself to do what I, I really want to do, um, it, you know, I, I, that's, it's, it's, it's very, basic. Um, but there are certain intellectual questions and ways that we, I think, can formulate questions that are not, um, that do not honor the work we really want to do. And I like the malevolent aspects of this. I, I, you know, a lot of people want me to come and talk about, oh, how redemptive conjuring is and the healing. That's great. I'm not interested in that as much. I'm interested in how people hurt other people and because this is a violent context. And a lot of the what I see in the historiography about enslaved people in particular has not impressed upon me the the, the violence in which they lived. I, I don't understand how you get, you know, we understand in our contemporary society that violent circumstances oftentimes beget violent people unless they have a lot of therapy, which we know enslaved people did not. You know, and so you have people who don't end up in those circumstances. Certainly, you know, it's all about kind of, you know, experiences and your unique sort of personality. But, you know, a good percentage end up being violent people and people who cannot rise above and are not, you know, uh, altruistic or just. They are really problematic. And I'm just interested in those aspects of life and, and, for me, that's how I access enslaved humanity. Humanity is not just the ideal. We, we really are the ideal versions of who we want to be. Um, we oftentimes show the excesses of who, you know, of humanity in those less, um, less complimentary moments of being ourselves, as well as the complimentary moments. And so I, I'm, I'm interested in capturing both. And so for me, formulating the question of the second project was about um, acknowledging what other people, you know, their feedback on what they wanted me to do, but also what really, what ignited the passion for, for research in me. And I, I know what it is. And so I made sure that as I think through my project, I am, you know, each chapter, each move is sort of, um, it's true to that element of the project. It's true to the passion that what brought me to the project what, what excited me about the questions. Um, so yeah, I, that's that's how they they relate. I'm still not tired of my first project. So that whole, that whole idea you get to, some people get tired of it. I still love it. And I, I think it's because I just was able to stay true to what I loved about the question initially. And so it just meant that I, I continue to just work on what I loved and I'm very privileged to continue to do the same, the second project. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, a really nice way to end. Very inspiring um, call to yeah, be true to oneself as a, as a writer and a scholar. Um, thank you so much for this uh, for this very engaging evening and and for giving us a lot to think about. Not only with respect to the case, which was brought to life so well, but a, a really um, thought provoking kind of conceptual framing around these ideas of. A, of opacity and the invocations of Du Bois. Um, it's, it's been really great. And thank you so much for, for joining us. So, and thank you all. Um, and uh, we have one more event for IRCPL in, in the semester. Uh, we're winding down here at Columbia. It's next week, not in the magic series, but um, uh, it's an event in our series on religion and climate. And we'll be having Robin Veldman from Texas A&M speaking about um, conservative Christian understandings of climate change as mediated through the Glenn Beck program on Fox. So a very different topic to Alexis, but please do feel free to join us for that. And Alexis, again, thank you so much. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing this project come to fruition.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night, everyone.